Hi, this is your host, Sapnil Bharatiya, and welcome to a brand new episode of T3M, our topic of this month. And the topic of this month is open source. And today we have with us Satya Sankaran, Chief Operating Officer at Cloud Casa Catalogic, to talk about this topic. Satya, it's great to have you back on the show. Sapnil, it's a pleasure uh, being here uh, always. And, and I was just going to say, what a what a timely topic! Uh, what a what a fantastic topic you're running uh, this this month. Um, open source is just everywhere, uh, and and if people didn't know, I think OpenAI and ChatGPT is just kind of making this um, uh, uh, you know a, a household topic uh, these days, uh, right? So wonderful to be part of this discussion. What are the forces that are driving the adoption of open source? I mean, if you look, you know, in the cloud, open source has kind of become de facto. We we uh, we were at KubeCon few you know a few weeks ago, and all you see there is open source. Talk about what is the driver? What is the what is driving this adoption of open source cloud? Yeah, I would say two two main things, uh, uh, Swapnil. What's driving adoption of open source is really one um, trust. Uh, we human beings make a lot of decisions based on trust, uh, and and a lot of times we. We even supersede other factors with, uh, you know, what we trust the most. And, and what I think open source is completely cracked open is that it can get people's trust. The source code is visible for everybody to use. Um, you know, no government is out there saying you cannot use open source products, uh, right? <laughs> everybody trusts it because they can see it. It's, it operates in transparency. Um, and, and and that is is a primary uh, uh, driving factor. And then comes community. You could trust something, um, but unless it's popular, people aren't going to use, right? Uh, and this goes hand in hand when more and more people using open source, it becomes an, just a de facto standard that people are going to use because everybody else is using it and there is a significant amount of trust. And if you don't trust, you can look into it and see what it does and what it doesn't do. Um, and 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 that drives uh, a lot of the adoption. Uh, I think we we see today. When we look at open source, uh, 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 you talked about Kubernetes whole ecosystem. Just because it is open source doesn't mean each company should just lean towards that. You know, open source. When it comes to the open source market, it could be fully you know market where you can download things for free from. GitHub or GitLab, or you can go with a vendor, you still have to do the same kind of you know review as you would do with any proprietary software. So talk a bit about when enterprises, they do either make a switch or you know start something new and they are looking at open source uh, based solutions. What are some of the criteria they should look at before they make a decision? Yeah, great question. I mean, in a recent webinar, uh, we ran some polls, uh, Swapnil. We asked people, hey, what is your preference, open source or closed source commercial solutions? And of course, majority uh, and a lion's share of people on the webinar picked open source. Uh, that tells you that's the preferred model if we can find a solution in that model, right? Second question we asked, we kind of tried to dig a little deeper. Uh, we asked them, do you want open source free and completely free solutions? Do you want open source with paid support? Um, and, and or would you go with you know commercial where you have an existing relationship and, and so on? And you suddenly saw a lion's share of the same users pick open source with paid support as the majority um, uh, uh, preference because um, Look, not everybody is going to know every, even if you operate in complete transparency, you still need skill sets to understand what an open source solution does and and, and what you need, uh, uh, how you need to configure it to make it work for your environment. And, and, and you're not going to have users that are an expert at, you know, 100 open source technologies. That's just not uh, a plausible uh, uh, a scenario. Um, you get to if if you are one of those users that gets to focus on you know one open source project and that's what you need to build expertise on you know great for you good for you um, but if you are like the majority of IT infrastructure folks or developers that are using a combination of you know 10 15 open source projects to make something work then you're not going to be an expert at everything and that you need the right level of expertise and support to make sure that open source actually works for you. 
uh, because no piece of software is written to work for everybody you know one way you're going to have to be able to configure it you're going to be able to troubleshoot it i mean you're going to have to have all of these capabilities and and i think that's one of the models that you work on top of open source to deliver for uh, uh, for users it is a win win i mean of course it's everything could be free but you know somebody's got to pay these developers and their work and effort at some point uh, right um, and and what you will see is that with with open source it creates that win win approach where you know yes you are essentially getting a large portion of the technology for free but you're only paying for some support and services on top of it or if you're running it as a managed uh, service you're getting paying for some of that convenience right so um i think that creates the win win model uh, people are looking for at the end of it you end up paying less for software and technology and you get a more trusted more widely adopted technology for your use um and and that's win win for a customer perspective i've been covering open source for a very long time and what what i also see is that one of the most important not the most but one of the important kind of constituents of open source is also players who are offering commercial solutions based on that open source uh, project like uh, we talked about Velero you know where you folks you know log cause of Velero was uh, um, announced at KubeCon so talk a bit about the importance of this whole ecosystem because without this ecosystem i mean i can go back to the farming growing potato is easier but without the whole ecosystem of truckers and restaurants and it, it, it's used so I, i love that analogy so talk a bit about the role of you know commercial aspect of open source before we go into that let me explain uh, at least how uh, this is not my idea but it's something that stuck with me the first time i read this right uh, how do you kind of uh, you know what is what are the various open source topologies that exist i think it's important to understand that before we talk about you know what model works best on each of these the each of these topologies right uh, this is based on a book by um uh, Uh, Nadia Iqbal I think is her name and and uh, a book called Working in Public right uh, and and she characterizes you know these open source projects into four types really two axes contributor growth and user growth right um and and if you have uh, you know low contributor growth low user growth that basically becomes a pet project right you have your own project and you're still building something on your own and you're open sourcing it nothing really happens other than you know you are building this in in public right now i think pet projects are most useful for finding your next gig if you want to find the next job you know pet projects are amazing uh, we do every every person that is hiring these days looks at your github profile uh, and these pet projects can be a huge way to advertise you know your skill sets primarily uh, to do more um, uh, eventually uh, for a company right the then there is the uh, um the other side which is that there is low contributor growth um and and and, and these are effectively uh, uh clubs there is low user growth um and but a high contributor growth so that means there are a lot of users but everybody that is that is that is contributing to this project actually becomes effectively a user right so this i think nadia calls them clubs um right and these are both models that aren't really great at commercializing um right one is a toy great for hiring the other is a club you may have a pet project idea or you may be into uh, you know some automation of um, you know something in your house that only a few people have it could be a game that you know one of some of your few friends play you know those are things that are are you know primarily good for these types of uh, um, open source projects and then the two projects two types of projects which is really around you know high user growth category right and high user growth but low contributors not many contributors but lots and lots of users right that's really what nadia calls them stadium projects and and why is it called stadium projects because you are a football pa- fan you're a manchester united fan for example you know you've got a small group of players playing 
and then there are millions of people watching you, right? Um, and, and it's stadium because it works very much like that sports team stadium model uh, where, you know, there is a small group of play, players doing what they do best. And then there are lots of users, lots of people viewing and, and, and getting utility out of those. These are great projects to deliver, you know, support for, uh, right? Because you, again, only a few people know what they're doing. And if you want the rest of them to be able to pick up, there are a lot of support ecosystems that goes around it um, and, 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 and so on. And then there is the fourth model, high contributor growth, high user growth. Um, you know, Linux is a great example. Kubernetes is a great example. You know, so many contributors and so many users. When you see both, it effectively creates its own ecosystem uh, where, you know, multiple vendors come in to, to, you know, plug many gaps that are there in the ecosystem. So uh, you really have to look at, you know, what open source project that you're trying to add value to, where it fits in this kind of topology. And uh, what we've picked up and, and try to add value to is, is Velero, which kind of fits that stadium project. It's quite not an ecosystem in itself yet, but it's got an enormous amount of users um, and it is focused on a very specific use case with you know, about 200 plus contributors you know, uh, creating that open source project. And that's where we're trying to add value. We're trying to add value through two, two ways. One is to provide support for users that are using Valero. Uh, and two is to provide that as a managed service so that uh, you essentially don't have to manage a backup infrastructure. If you're not going to manage your own primary infrastructure and putting it all on cloud, you know what are the odds that you don't want to do manage your own backups? Right? That's really the thought process behind uh, these these. Uh, involvement of uh, involvement of us in open source i also want to talk a bit about the role of foundations because uh, if you look at open source there is code which is with foundation there is code which is owned by certain companies both are right way to do open source but sometimes when the code is owned by a company sometimes their competitors are worried that hey they may get locked out the license may get changed or the company might have more influence over the code so they feel more comfortable uh, leveraging code base which is available through some foundations and there are some great foundations like apache is there linux foundation is there open infra foundation is there and these foundations have held accelerate the adoption of open source. So I want to hear from you to tell our viewers the role that you have seen these foundations have played in making open source you know, more popular and it's getting adopted across the board. Yeah, it goes back to trust, right? Um, and when you know it's owned by an open source foundation, you're going to know it's going to remain open source. You know it's going to be committed to community use of that project. Uh, and, and of course, it comes with a level of sponsorship to make these things work, right? But that doesn't need not, that need not be the only way uh, you make it work. I'll go back to the example of, uh, you know, Velero and how beautifully it works. Uh, Velero is not a CNCF project. Um, Velero is uh, owned originally by Heptio, which was acquired by VMware, and VMware has continued investing uh, in this project. Um, but VMware has stayed true to the open source ethos with respect to Valero. Um, and why we carry so much trust in this ecosystem is because they have openly invited other maintainers into this uh, 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 ecosystem, right? So you now have not just maintainers from VMware, but also maintainers from uh, Microsoft, maintainers from uh, uh, Red Hat. Red Hat actually now has most number of maintainers outside of VMware uh, uh, themselves, it's a large team that is that is uh, building uh, uh, this this project up, uh, and and I think we've also seen SUSE play a role in this. We've seen Dell play a role in this. You know, we're contributing heavily to Velero uh, uh, these days, and so all of this kind of plays a role in that you you are kind of operating it with the right ethos. Um, and now that multiple maintainers exist and a large contributor base exists, even if you changed the license model of this project down the road, 
it is now becomes really easy for us to fork this and basically run with the rest of the maintainers, uh, this project set. So it creates that barrier to go change something um, uh, completely. So uh, foundations are great because it allows you, gives you a certain level of guarantee that this is how the project is going to be. But apart from foundation, the next best model is really shared development. If one company is doing all the work behind open source, you know those companies don't exist for public benefit uh, unless you know they're registered as one. Their job is to monetize it at some point, and it comes from adoption many times. Uh, but in a model like Velero, you have multiple maintainers playing a role, um, in 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 lots of people contributing, and that essentially future proves how open source uh, gets used. And, and the other thing I want to highlight is uh, 100 million uh, uh, Docker pulls uh, just this week, Swapna. And it happened so nonchalantly. Can you think of a software or a technology that's been pulled 100 million times and nobody notices, right? Uh, not VMware, not the maintainers. Um, and, and, and I happen to be uh, doing an interview uh, with block and files that morning, and I just went in to gather proof for some of the things that I'm saying, and I I'm, I'm and I opened this and I just saw that it ticked up to a hundred million uh, uh, Docker pulls. Um, again, that comes from a large number of people putting their trust, especially in a mission critical workload like Velero, um, and 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 that's only possible because you know so many are contributing and so many are using. Um, and and uh, that's the way forward in this ecosystem. If we look at uh, cloud costs, or if you look at you know catalogy, uh, what will you see that companies like yours play in this whole larger open source ecosystem? I think uh, there are very in an open source ecosystem, uh, there are there is contributions and there is uh, you know supporting right. How can you contribute to an open source community? Of course, you can code. Um, but coding isn't the only way to contribute to an open source uh, community. And in fact, uh, a lot of companies go through stages where, you know, they make lots of bug fixes first before they get into core uh, part of the projects and, and contribute to core part of the projects. So you can, you can do a lot of bug fixes. Uh, you can own the core. Uh, you can add feature sets. I mean, these are all kind of falling into, hey, um, I'm going to write code to support this open source community. The, the second type of community, especially in a high user growth project you're talking about, is that lots of users picking up this new project, right? Um, and, and often there is a Slack channel that you have to maintain. There is a forum you have to support. You know, somebody still needs to handhold these people um, into using the solution right. Uh, using the technology right. Uh, you know, we do a lot of that today with, with Valero. In fact, if you went to the Slack channel, you know, it has over 3,200 users, I think, at this point. And, and you will see in the last few months, you know, practically our team answers every question that comes through in that, uh, you know, forum and, and Slack channel. Uh, again, it's all part of getting people to successfully adopt uh, this open source technology and kind of only when they adopt, they become part of the community, right? You kind of have to be a welcoming member of that community. That is one way to contribute. And, and we do a lot of that today um, because again, we built a three-year expertise on Venero today and, and, and we do that. In terms of commercial uh, uh, support on top of just, you know, uh, contributing to the community, um, of course, I think, um, one of the things in a knock on open source is that open source gets a lot of things right, but uh, that a lot of things that are objective are gotten right almost immediately uh, because, again, you get the wisdom of the crowd. But a lot of things that are subjective, uh, a crowd doesn't help you, right? Uh, you don't get to uh, how many open source projects have really good UI is an example, right? Uh, um, and, and that's because UI is very subjective. No one person, you know, likes it, you know, the same way. Uh, and, and there is no real configurable UIs, you know, in, in this ecosystem. 
So uh, uh, what this unfortunately does is uh, it raises the bar for skill set uh, to adopt certain open source technologies because there is no democratization of those feature sets. There is no UI. There's no buddy can come in and just click through a bunch of buttons without having to you know, loan YAML files and, and so on. So uh, what we are also doing here um, is uh, building a service that allows people to kind of manage this project open source uh, Valero across multiple clusters from a centralized UI. Uh, so it's, it's a lot about making Valero more accessible to users so that they could run Valero for mission critical workloads. Because when your servers are down, when your clusters are down, you don't want to be reading through 400 pages of manual to figure out how to restore your clusters. You want to go to uh, an interface from where you can pick a recovery point, you can ask it to do what it needs to be done. A guided recovery path becomes very uh, important. And again, that's something we, we do. And the last piece is really, Commercial support, a community support is wonderful when you're getting onboarded, but when you're running your mission critical workloads on top of it, do you want to rely on someone on the other side of the world answering your Slack questions, um, or would you be want to would you be would you want to be in a position where you want to pick up the phone call and call a specific expert and say, hey, I'm running into this problem, I need this problem resolved, and and have a certain level of SLA and SLO. Uh, that you are running into. And that's something, again, companies like us can contribute to. Satya, thank you so much for joining me today and talk about open source. It was an interesting discussion. And as usual, I would love to have you back on the show. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks, Swapna.